Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Lou Nani, and welcome from an overcast Notre Dame campus. Yesterday, it poured all day, rain that we desperately needed. We've had just a beautiful uh, summer here on campus, and uh, it's, the weather's supposed to be nice for the rest of the week, and unfortunately, it looks like we could have some thunderstorms uh, on Saturday for uh, the home opener against uh, Duke. Believe it or not, we are completing our fifth week of classes here on campus. Hard to believe, uh, only one week into September. We're pleased to report uh, that the COVID-19 infections have been steadily dropping uh, across campus. In fact, the, the last seven day positivity rate is 1.2%. Uh, which is a, a remarkable uh, statistic given where we were a few weeks ago. To date, 560 students have recovered from coronavirus and there are 56 active cases. We, we began surveillance testing on August 21st. And this week we have emerged with a new form of uh, surveillance testing the saliva test. We actually established our own lab in McCourtney Hall uh, that is led by Professor Michael Fender and a team of faculty members where they'll be able to execute the tests right there on site and within just hours, uh, they should have answers. Um, the scale of the collection process uh, now allows us to test every student, faculty, and staff member several times each for the remainder of the semester. Uh, so that is a very promising breakthrough. I wanna offer uh, credit for the downward trend in positive cases, first and foremost, to our students. Uh, they have really focused on taking seriously uh, the health protocols uh, that are in place. And then a lot of team members at Notre Dame have rallied together uh, to execute very effectively over the last few weeks. Now, to be clear, nobody is declaring victory. Um, we still know that uh, there's, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of days uh, to go uh, to complete this semester. Our concern uh, right now is about the first football weekend. Uh, a letter went out to all parents yesterday, and a communication is going out to all students today. Um, there's a lot of tailgating and socializing uh, that goes around the football weekend, and we need to be uh, especially careful. I'd like to say that if any of you plan to return for any football weekends, even if you're not able to attend the game in the stadium, uh, to see your children or whatever. If you plan to host any gatherings, we ask you uh, to be sure to adhere to Notre Dame's health protocols, which call for no gatherings of larger than 10 persons. And even if you're outside, then we need to maintain physical distancing and masks need to be worn. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we don't see another surge uh, as we return uh, to the football season. The nature of this virus is such that the actions of a few can readily undermine the fate of the many. So we need to remain vigilant and everyone needs to be on board. So that's a little COVID-19 update. Now I am thrilled uh, to be joined today by the IA O'Shaughnessy Dean of the College of Arts and Letters, Sarah Mastillo. She is beginning her third year as the Dean in January. She will just be the second longest serving Dean currently at the university. That shows you how new this academic leadership team is. And it's a really terrific team uh, across the board. Sarah is a Notre Dame undergrad with a PhD from Duke. She, her expertise is in the area of social causes of childhood mental illness. 
Uh, she joined the Notre Dame faculty in 2014, and she comes to us today principally as a parent. She is in Minnesota, where she has just dropped off uh, her second child, her daughter, uh, to begin uh, her schooling at Carleton College. Welcome, Sarah. How has the drop-off gone? Uh, if I look like a sobbing mess, it's because I am. <laughs> it's been so hard, even with number two. Uh, I mean, you have kids in college, you know, it doesn't get any easier. And, it, you know, with all the tragedy and suffering with COVID, one of the blessings to me has been that I've gotten to spend so much time with my older two kids. Um, so that makes it even harder to say goodbye. But at the same time, I'm really happy that, you know, that the kids get to be here, uh, you know, as, as it is at Notre Dame. And so it's, you know, it's really good for, for them. That's great. Well, our prayers are with you. I think there's a lot of parents and grandparents that are that are watching in today and know that feeling. And I know that as soon as you finish this interview, you're gonna be driving eight hours uh, back to campus. So uh, we'll be praying for a safe trip and, and a not too emotional one if possible. Um, Thank but, you. But tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how did you ultimately choose to attend Notre Dame? So I grew up in uh, outside of Chicago in Western Springs. I went to St. John of the Cross. Um, my parents then moved to the East Coast, to the Philadelphia area, um, so I spent some years there as well. Um, when I was looking at colleges or thinking about college, um, we didn't have any strong family connections or, you know, to any colleges or universities. My mom went to a regional school and dropped out when she got married, mm -hmm. and my dad was, when he was in high school, he was on a military base in Japan because my grandfather was in the service, and they handed him a ticket to a, a transport boat um, to take back to the U.S. And a, and a train ticket to, uh, to go to Oklahoma where his grandmother lived. So he went to the, he, that was his only choice was to go to the University of Oklahoma where his grandmother lived. So just this whole idea of, of, of college choice was kind of, you know, kind of new to us. Um, but my next door neighbor was a Notre Dame alum and he got me the application back when it was, you know, paper. Um, and then when I got in, he, he invited me over and, and sat me down and said, I'm going to tell you all the reasons why you need to go to Notre Dame. And he, you know, he talked about the dorms and he talked about the masses and he talked about football and all the rest. But the, the piece of it that stuck with me was he talked about the alumni network. He told stories. He was, he was in business. I don't remember what kind, but he told stories about business deals, you know, going through because people had a Notre Dame connection. And he just told story after story about how the alumni network had been there for him his whole life. And it made it sound like, you know, most colleges and universities are four years, but Notre Dame is forever. Yeah. Well, that's what an amazing story. And, and that, uh, that gentleman, that alumnus, uh, obviously, like so many out there, uh, felt so passionately about the university that he wanted to share it with you. So how has that uh, alumni network, how have you experienced that since, as, as, and especially as a, as a dean, being able to tap in uh, to that wonderful network that really separates Notre Dame from so many other universities? Absolutely. I, I can say, yeah, honestly, the Notre Dame network has been there for me, you know, since my time at Notre Dame. First and foremost, I met my husband, uh, who's a 91 grad um, through mutual friends. Um, so the alumni network helped me right from, you know, from day one. Uh, but it's just, it's been everything to us. When, you know, when we, so I got married young, I had kids young, um, moved to North Carolina to go to graduate school. And we, you know, we were broke. My husband was a Catholic school teacher at the time and I was a graduate student. Our families were far away. and it was Notre Dame alums that became our village when we were, you know, raising uh, particularly our two older kids. Um, my closest friends, uh, Caroline and Bridget, you know, one was a Notre Dame grad, one was a St. Mary's grad. Their husbands were Notre Dame grads. None of us knew each other when we were on, on campus, though we all overlapped. But, you know, we used to stand in the back of Immaculate Conception Parish rocking, you know, crying babies together. And, and you know, they've just been some of my closest friends ever since, even though we all live in different places now, their oldest kids are seniors and one of them's in the College of Arts and Letters. So I will hand a diploma this year to somebody whose diapers I changed when he was a baby. And that just doesn't happen everywhere. 
That's um, true. That's so I, great, yeah. It's a great story. That, that is, uh, that'll be another emotional, like you need any more emotional moments, uh, you know, coming up, but you got till May to get ready for that. How, how did you choose to return in 2014 uh, as a faculty member to your alma mater? What, what, what drove that? I know you had some great choices along the way. So yeah, I, I started my career at Duke. Um, when I finished my PhD, my husband started a PhD program at UNC Chapel Hill. So I took a faculty position in the medical school at Duke. And I loved the medical school at Duke. It was a really exciting, dynamic research environment, but it wasn't um, kind of part of the life of the university. And medical schools are kind of their own thing. And so I really miss being you know, more involved with undergrads. I really wanted to train graduate students. Um, so when he finished, we, we took jobs at Purdue, which is another outstanding research university. Um, but I still felt like something was missing. Like I wanted to be able to be my full self at work and I wanted students to be able to be, you know, fully themselves as well. And I, you know, really wanted to be at a place where no topic was off limits, where we could talk about faith, where um, formation involved, you know, mind, body, and spirit. So that's what attracted me to Notre Dame. That's great. And I know you had an offer at the same time, I think, from Northwestern that was offering you a joint app appointment in their medical school. Uh, was it difficult to to make that decision between the two institutions? And how did we how were we lucky to retract you back to Notre Dame? Yeah, it was. I think it was fall of 2013. I guess when I was deciding um, where to go, and I, you know, the Northwestern job was kind of a dream job. It was a joint appointment between the medical school and the sociology department, and the Evanston campus is right on the lake. It's beautiful. And the med school is right downtown Chicago. And, you know, I, you just can't beat it. It's a top, top university with really fabulous faculty and students. Um, but when I was making that decision, um, you know, so we went to Evanston and, you know, looked there and then we came to South Bend and it was a football weekend. And I just remember standing in the middle of South Quad it was a sunny, beautiful fall day. The band was marching by and I looked up and on the lampposts at that time were those banners with the Father Jenkins quote, to heal, unify and enlighten the world deeply in need. Hmm. And when I read that, I just like that, I knew that this, this was where I wanted to be. Wow, that's great. Uh, um, you never think of the full impact of a banner. <laughs> so. It's really good that, uh, that that stuck out at that particular time. So your research, your academic expertise has been interdisciplinary by, by nature. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what, what drives your, your interest, your motivation uh, personally about mental health issues, uh, especially as it affects adolescents? Sure. Um, I... You know, I always get, people always ask me, you know, when, when I say what I do or when I say what I research, they're like, you're a sociologist? Like, you don't sound like a sociologist. You sound like a psychologist um, because I study mental illness. But if you think about, like, think about health more broadly. Think about, um, you know, when people think about health, they think about the kind of the genetic causes of illness and disease or the biological causes of illness and disease. But if you think about say, like the top 10 causes of death in the United States, heart disease, cancer, accidents, suicide, diabetes, those, you know, they have biological and genetic components, but they have strong social and behavioral components as well. Things like diet and exercise, relationships, stress level. Um, and so I was really interested in looking at the impact of, you know, the conditions that we live in on health and specifically mental health. So my work looks at, um, I mostly look at adverse childhood experiences, so what childhood conditions are like and how that impacts um, the development of mental illness over childhood and adolescence. I've dabbled a little bit into physical health lately, um, but, but mental illness is where, you know, where my heart lies. There's, there's so much suffering, um, you know, in our country and around the world uh, in terms of mental illness. And, and we just need more, more research uh, to, to help. No, and, and I think that um, we all, we've talked about this many times that uh, 
that this COVID-19 crisis has, has really made it all the more difficult for anybody who is predisposed to anxiety, depression, any mental health issues. How has that kind of affected your vision for the college and your own research as a college to, to do more for um, students and young people who are suffering uh, from enhanced causes of mental illness? Well, my, my current project, I'm on an NIH grant right now with some colleagues from other universities, and my current project is um, looking at initiation into substance use in adolescents. And we are looking at um, parent effects, sibling effects, and peer effects. So how, you know, what, how those external influences, um, which ones are, you know, more salient in, in adolescents starting to use substances. And so one of the great things, so it's a project with two psychologists and two sociologists. And one of the great things about interdisciplinary teams is that, um, you know, my interest is parent. A lot of what I look at are parent level risk factors for, for child outcomes. But you know, one of my colleagues is really interested in the peer effects and another one's interested in the sibling effects. And so we can all examine the same problem with different questions in mind um, to, you know, to hopefully address this, uh, you know, address this, this problem, this question. Yeah, great. Well, you know, you've had uh, a very interesting tenure as brief as it's been as Dean of the largest college uh, at the university. Um, you uh, you had your first year, which is always tough to, to begin something a big a, a leadership role like this. But but it was a relatively normal year in the life of the university. Your second year, uh, we send the students home in the se- halfway through the second semester uh, to remote learning, and then this year has been anything but conventional so far. How have you adapted as a leader, and how have you had to to make changes? Uh, to direct the college? Well, it's funny. I think that, you know, I, I said in, uh, in in March that I feel like I jinxed, I jinxed us because in February, I said to um, people in my office, like, I feel like I'm starting to get the hang of this, <laughs> this Dean <deed> thing. <laughs> and so it, um, you know, got thrown a curveball right after saying that. Uh, it, it's been, it's been really challenging, but to adapt to COVID, um, if you think about um, teaching, you know, going remote right away when most of our faculty don't have experience in, in online teaching because we so value the residential experience, that was super challenging for everyone, uh, faculty and students. And then as we moved into preparing for this year, we had some pretty unique challenges in the College of Arts and Letters. If you think about our music programs, for example, singing is one of you know, the most dangerous activities in terms of COVID transmission. And so how could we do musical theater? How could we do opera? How could we have our ensembles? Um, we got creative and our faculty have been just so creative and flexible and willing to you know, go the extra mile. And so we have kids singing in the concourse of the stadium. We have kids singing in plexiglass booths in the, in the music building. Um, They've really, you know, in the facilities, people here are just incredible and, you know, working with our faculty and working with the students to, to try to make this all work. But so we've tried to adapt on the teaching end. The research end has been very difficult as well. If you think about, you know, say the psychologist doing human subjects work, uh, we can't do an EEG on people's brains from six feet away. And so how do we adapt? I can go online with my, you know, interviews of kids, but but the, you know, the neuroscientist can't, um, or even the, you know, the humanists who needed to be in their archives or needed to go to a library somewhere else, like how can they get access to their sources in this? And we extended the tenure clock for assistant professors, but the people who are honestly getting the most squeezed by this are graduate students because, you know, they have funding for a certain number of years and if their work got interrupted, you know, if they were in the middle of doing a human subjects project or they were, you know, we had students who were in Europe collecting, you know, data and archives that had to come home. And so it, you know, it's been really challenging to think about how can we best support those students in finishing their dissertations. Yeah. Well, you know, I've often thought, um, Sarah, that, that even in good times, uh, you may have the most challenging job 
of, of all the deanships because you have uh, uh, such a, a large uh, faculty and, uh, and, and cohort of students, but really they're kind of broken into three very distinct areas. You have the humanities where we have our core theology and philosophy and other disciplines. Then you've got the social sciences, which is your own heritage. And then we have the arts, uh, both performing and visual arts. And they're very different groups, all kind of assembled under one college. Um, what, what are your primary goals uh, to take the college to the next level? What, what's your vision? Well, that's been one of the you know, really important parts of getting through COVID to me is that, you know, we set these goals. I set these goals when I started this job and then everything kind of came to a screeching halt in the spring. But, you know, once we started getting through some of the COVID things, it was just it's so important to me to make sure that we keep working, you know, towards those goals uh, and not let COVID stop us. So I, I talk about my goals as falling under three eyes. Um, impact, interdisciplinarity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So by impact, I mean um, for the faculty, it's the impact they have on students in the classroom, but it's also the impact they can have on the world through their research. Mm -hmm. And for students, it's the, you know, students are taking our Notre Dame values and our Notre Dame education out into the world, and they're going to have an impact on their in, you know, places of employment, on their churches, on their communities, on their families. And so how can we maximize the input um, that, that we have on our students and then that our students can go have in the world. Mm -hmm. Interdisciplinarity, um, you know, we are so strong in our disciplines at Notre Dame as we should be, particularly in philosophy and theology and the humanities. Um, but how, you know, so many of the complex problems facing the world today require us to step out of those disciplines and, and come together uh, across departments in my college, but across colleges as well. Mm -hmm. And inclusion is about, um, diversifying Notre Dame uh, in terms of, you know, bringing together people, faculty, students, and staff from, from a variety of backgrounds and experiences, different ways of thinking about things, um, bringing people together and then making sure that the Notre Dame that they encounter is, is welcoming and supportive and that everybody can feel a part of the Notre Dame family. Right. I mean, a lot of uh, universities have diversity without inclusion, right? They're, they're segregated communities um, within kind of the larger university. Um, Father John at times has said that, uh, that they're, they're, they're more like multiversities than they are universities. There's no unifying force that kind of brings everybody together. Uh, tell us a little bit about more about your vision for um, diversity and inclusion. And I know in particular, you had this vision for a center on race and ethnicity before all of the riots and social and racial unrest um, kind of emerged in this country. And if this vision is pretty far along, could you say a little bit about that? Sure. This has been, diversity and inclusion have been really important to me my entire career. My dissertation 20 years ago was on racial disparities in health. Um, so this is something I've always cared about. And as a faculty member, I tried to help make change with the research I did and the courses that I taught. And now as an administrator, um, I get to you know, think about what structures and initiatives we need at the university to help us make progress in this area. And so one of them, as you mentioned, is, is a new um, Center for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity. It has not launched yet, but it is very close. I've been working on this for two years um, as Dean with a, with a great committee of faculty, a few of which you've, you've interviewed on, on, this, mm -hmm. on this show. Mm -hmm. um, but so the idea is to create a center that will be the intellectual home for people who study race, um, people of all races who study race, uh, we have a lot of faculty in the College of Arts and Letters who, who already um, focus on race in their research, and but there's no place for them to come together. And so we want to kind of, you know, unify some of the work being done by, you know, creating a, a physical space for people to come together and share ideas and uh, help each other move their work along. We want to invite more students into you know, these important topics by offering curriculum um, through the center. 
And then we want to have a community outreach component um, where we can partner with the community more on, on initiatives related to race. So I'm really, really excited about the progress that we're making on this. That's terrific. And you know, I, I'm um, a product of the College of Arts and Letters, a 1984 grad. And, and I, I, while I had a, a terrific experience at Notre Dame and, and a wonderful education, I would say as I went off to live in a shanty town in Chile and then and the Dominican Republic and then worked with the homeless overall for about 15 years, probably the, the area that Notre Dame, I think, not that I blame Notre Dame at all, but least prepared me uh, for those experience wa was in the area of diversity, uh, being able to embrace all of the challenges of race and ethnicity. So I, I think that's a, that's a wonderful development. Another center that you've uh, helped to uh, really bring um, a, a greater prioritization to has been the Shaw uh, Center for Families and Children. And in particular, um, they uh, are moving to a new location off campus and they provide a lot of uh, mental health services as well as research and working with some of the same adolescents and children uh, that are a focus of your research. Can you tell us a little bit about that and their impact uh, and what that can do for a world that's deeply in need? Yeah, so this is a place where I feel like the College of Arts and Letters can really have uh, an important impact on a world mm -hmm. deeply in need, as you said. Um, as you know, Kristen talked about with you, we have this Shaw Center for Children and Families, which is really a, a gem in terms of being a research center. They have a small but growing clinical program. Um, but we would like to grow our clinical services in both ch children and families, but also in adults as well. Um, we have a facility on Hill Street. I think you're, you're jumping the gun a little bit that we, we're not quite there yet in terms of being able to um, expand it. We bought the lot next to it. Um, okay, and so that's definitely one of our plans. Uh, we want to bring together the, um, the Shaw Center, which is essentially our, our child and family research center. It has some clinical services. Um, we wanna unite that with our adult research um, and then ha have a, our growing clinic as part of it. And so the, the research and the clinic really you know, work with each other that, that the research informs the services we provide and then the people we provide service to help to inform, you know, help with, with our research projects. And so it's really, it's a win-win for faculty um, we also are hoping to, so we're going to grow the, you know, grow the faculty so we can provide more services. And so that's, you know, kind of part two is being able to serve students on campus where we still have a, you know, a need for, for more services than we're able to provide. And then to be able to provide, you know, high quality evidence-based services to the community. Um, and then third, our graduate students, uh, it will really improve um, and enhance the training that we can provide to graduate students. Because right now, since we, our clinical services are so limited, they have to leave the area to go get training. And so if we're able to train them in-house, that will help us recruit better because it'll be you know, a more attractive program, not having to go 60 or 90 minutes away for your clinical hours. Um, but it'll also you know, help us uh, help us you know, with, with the students training by, by being able to, for our faculty to do it instead of sending them elsewhere. Terrific, that's a, that's a wonderful service to the community and, and the research that is pioneered will hopefully have an impact uh, far in, in regions far greater than, than, than the local. Um, you also talked about interdisciplinarity and you know you alluded to this already, Sarah. But it, it it's a challenge to break the guilds, right? The silos that exist in in higher education among departments and different colleges. So could you share with us um, an example or two of of either something that you're doing or you envision doing that will be high impact interdisciplinary initiatives? Yeah. So. Um... My own work is so interdisciplinary and it's really shown me how important it is to bring together people, you know, from different fields. The, the structures that are in place at universities really reward us staying in our disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we get better as a university. Uh, you know, Father Ted had the vision of wanting us to be a great research university. And, and how we do that is by faculty being strong in their disciplines 
and by having strong graduate programs. But so we have to create mechanisms. We have to create structures that encourage people to leave, not to leave their disciplines. We still want people to be strong in their disciplines, but that encourage people to come together. So if you think about, you know, any of the major problems in the world today, from, you know, artificial intelligence to, to sustainability to the U.S. healthcare system, all of those kinds of things need people in the humanities and the social sciences and science and engineering, you know, working together on those kinds of problems. So I've been putting a lot of effort into interdisciplinary initiatives, like the, the Ray Center is one. Um, so we're trying to encourage uh, interdisciplinary research by creating mechanisms like that where people can come together. We're also launching more interdisciplinary curricula. So for example, we have in the college, we're, we're launching a suite of minors that bring together on the one end, humanities, arts, and social sciences, and business and the economy on the other end and, and focus on the, the intersections of, of those different fields. And so what we're hoping is that, you know, that we are gonna, so one example is we have a, a new minor on um, uh, business and economic history. Mm-hmm. It's being, it's being, this fall is when it launched for the first time. Uh, there's a lot of student interest. It was started by Elizabeth Cole, who's the chair of the history department, who came to us from Harvard Business School, is an expert on their case study method. And she is hoping to um, you know, prepare future business leaders by examining the past. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because of course in history, we, we learn about the future by, by looking at the past. And so we're really hoping that through these new minors that we are going to create more well-rounded um, business leaders of the future. Yeah. You've also done something in the area of computer science, right? Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so we have a, a whole bunch of initiatives um, with the College of Engineering with computer science. We have the data science minor that, that's only a few years old. Mm-hmm. And if your kids are trying to get in it, we're working to get them off the waiting list. Um, we have the, the data science minor. We have a new BA in computer science, which is the essentially the computer science major. But instead of being in the College of Engineering and taking the engineering core, it's in the College of Arts and Letters. It's the same classes, but they take the Arts and Letters core. And then they have an Arts and Letters major or minor to pair with the computer science degree. And that's, again, the, the idea of creating a more well-rounded computer scientist. Um, we have, oh, the Technology Ethics Center. Right. So one of the things, that was one of my first priorities when I started as dean was if you think about, you know, our Catholic character and you think about our strengths in theology and philosophy, there are so many questions related to um, AI and machine learning and biotechnology that, that I just felt like we as a Catholic university should be contributing to this conversation. And so uh, worked with, you know, a team of faculty to make a plan to, for us to study technology ethics, the ethics of technology. And there are some places in the country and in, in other countries as well that, that examine the ethics of, of technology, but most of them do it from the technology perspective rather than from the ethics perspective. Mm-hmm. And so I felt like, you know, Notre Dame being who we are, we could really start the conversation differently because of our strengths in theology and philosophy. And so we're trying to have a different, you know, a different kind of center and a different kind of conversation where the, where the ethics come first and really help drive the agenda of the technology rather than the other way around. And so that's, that launched last year. Um, and we are hiring faculty now and we have a really exciting new partnership with IBM um, to help to work with them to think about having ethics drive their technological advances. And so that's been, yeah, just a really exciting development. And that's university-wide. And that was a $20 million gift, I believe, from IBM to help jumpstart um, the Center for um, Ethics and and, uh, and Technology. Let me ask you, what is the largest, what are the largest majors in the college and what are your fastest growing majors? The largest major is economics. Uh, by far, um, we've got about 800 economics majors right now out of about 2,200 students who have a first major in arts and letters. And five Uh, years ago or 10 years ago, that number had to be much less. Much less. Yeah. Uh, 
so that one's a really big one. Um, let's see, after them, it's political science and psychology. So three of the social sciences take the top three slots. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of growing majors, uh, you'd be surprised at some of them. So uh, design in the um, art, art history and design department is, is really growing in popularity, um, both industrial design and visual communication design. And um, on the, again, in the arts are, um, our musical theater is a minor, but that's tremendously popular. Um, a lot of our arts programs like in film, television and theater is, is really growing as well. And theology and philosophy are always really solid um, in the college that they, you know, despite some of the humanities have lost students over the years, but, but those have remained pretty, pretty stable. Um, you know, I think because of our identity and the, the kinds of students that we attract to Notre Dame. Um, and so we're, we're, you know, thrilled about that. And as a college, you provide the service to the larger student body, right? So you have, whether they're engineering, science, business, architecture majors, they're taking core curriculum, which is in philosophy and in the theology and in writing and, and literature and, and things of that nature too. So you're, you go well beyond your, your majors in the college. We do. So at Notre Dame, the College of Arts and Letters has about 25% of the students. The College of Business has about 25% of the students. Science and engineering, um, about the same. And then, you know, architecture is small. Um, but we teach the vast majority of the core curriculum. I think over 90% of the core is in the College of Arts and Letters. And so we, you know, every student who comes to Notre Dame walks through our doors multiple times, whether they major in the college or not. And a lot of students who major in science, engineering, and business also have a second major in, in the College of Arts and Letters. Probably, I think it's about 50% of students at the university have a major in the College of Arts and Letters. So we touch every student through the core, but then we also touch, you know, half of them through a, through a major and many more through minors. And we consider it, you know, really a blessing to be able to, to do that, to be able to teach, you know, those core subjects of everybody takes two theology, um, almost everybody takes two philosophy. There's also this uh, second um, other way to do the second philosophy called an integration course, but, but most people choose to do the second philosophy right. as well. Um, so, so we, we teach them all and, and, and we're really grateful to be able to do it. Yeah. And God of the good life, uh, program in the philosophy department has just, has just mushroomed. It's, uh, it's, it's a rage among students and, and, uh, you know, Megan Sullivan and her team there have pioneered something. I know that it is receiving a lot of attention on campuses around the rest of the country too. Yeah. So it's super popular at Notre Dame. I think it's something like 800 students a year right now take out in the good life for their um, first philosophy. Um, and if you if you haven't sat in on a class, you, you should sit in on a class because it uh, even with COVID, it, it is you know feet stomping, uh, people debating, um, you know deep philosophical debates. So it's a really exciting class. But but one of the great things about it, from my perspective, is that it it is popular um, kind of all across the country. She Put together a kind of a training program and has a book coming out uh, that, that teaches other people how to teach this way, this highly interactive, um, very multimedia mm -hmm. method um, that the students just love and they really flock to. And so she's traveled all over the country training uh, elite universities, but also community colleges and everything in between. And so this, this class, this God and Good Life class is, is being taught all across the country but not as good as we teach it here. That's, I agree, I agree. She, uh, Megan and her team are just exceptional. And I have sat in a couple of those classes and the way that they're able to, to make Socrates and Plato and Aristotle real and meaningful uh, to today's students and their everyday situations and, and their discernment is decision-making is, uh, is, uh, is outstanding. So we've got just a um, maybe time for one last question. I'd just like to ask if you have any any closing thoughts, anything you'd like to share uh, with the viewing audience here uh, that are things that are on your mind or a message that you'd like to leave behind. Hmm. I can say that 
as always, I'm just so grateful for, for everyone's support. I, you know, I talked at the beginning about the Notre Dame family and how it's been there for me my whole life. Well, that's certainly been true since I've been a faculty member and now as Dean, I, I feel like I have the partnership of, you know, of our alums as, as we walk through this journey together. But I'm really hoping over the next few years to be able to move some of these initiatives I've been talking about forward. Um, and I'm really interested in partnering with, with anybody who's listening. Uh, at the top of the list, I'd say, is the, is the Race Center. Mm -hmm. um, as you heard when, we, uh, when you interviewed Mark and LaDonna, we've got you know, really talented faculty ready to move on this, but we have a lot of things that need to you know, come together for us to really make this the center that we want it to be. Um, I really want to launch this psychology clinic. We need to renovate the building to, to expand it so that we can bring together our, our child and uh, adult and, and you know, research with our clinical operations and to expand our clinic. Um, I really want to continue building these interdisciplinary programs. I think they're so important uh, from the Technology Ethics Center that you asked about to the programs with computer science and the, and the history of business and economics. So I'm always looking for ways to partner with our alums. The alumni have been really involved, particularly in our joint ventures with computer science. Um, a lot of people um, have consulted with us on you know, what they wanna see and people they hire, or they've been guest speakers in our, in our classes. And so uh, alumni involvement is just super, super important. And, and we're so grateful for the support. We want to continue moving forward, even with COVID and, and you know, to making Notre Dame the place that it, we all want it to be, to heal, unify, and enlighten a world deeply in need. Yeah, that's a beautiful note to end on. And, and uh, it, you know, going back to where we started with that alumni network and that parent network, um, we need you more than ever um, when it, in, in this tough economic climate, um, the opportunity to offer students meaningful internships and postgraduate jobs. If you have, any idea of, of opportunities, both within the companies where you work or among friends. Um, time and again, we just hear rave reviews about our students, how they separate themselves. And you wanna say something to that? Andy? I do, let me just jump yes. in with okay. one more thing that we yeah. didn't talk about today. And I'll just say quickly is, we have a new careers initiative in arts and letters called Beyond the Dome. And one of the things that, that our career director, Marty Whalen is doing is reaching out to alums uh, to try to get more internships for arts and letters students. So I'll just put in the plug there that, um, that we are gonna be contacting you. So contact the, the College of Arts and Letters office. Marty Whalen uh, is in charge of that. If you um, uh, wanna initiate contact and, and have more discussion along those lines, we're gonna, our students are gonna need uh, that alumni network more than ever over the next couple of years. Thank you, Sarah. You, it's been so much fun, and thanks for joining us on a, on an emotional day from Carleton College. Our prayers again uh, for your incredible work and outreach, but also uh, for for a safe journey uh, back to campus tonight. Um, we will be joining you next week on on Wednesday at noon once again with our new provost. Uh, uh, this time, you got to know her last time. Uh, when we met in July, but this time we'll be able to talk more uh, about her vision for the future and what she's learned during her tenure. Um, Provost Mari Lynn Miranda. And uh, so we hope to see you again next week, Wednesday at noon. Uh, thanks again, Sarah. We typically close these programs uh, with uh, an Ave Maria. Somebody, uh, I just read today that I didn't realize that, uh, you know, Ave, as you know, means hail and that uh, Ave Maria uh, was actually meant to be kind of a revo revolutionary call because at the time that well, the word that was used was Ave Imperator, which was basically um, hail to the emperor. And so when they came up with Ave Maria in a very different tone, it was, um, it was revolutionary. It was hail to Mary, the mother of God. And so, um, as she is our patroness, um, we ask you, if, if you uh, feel inclined in your workplaces and at home, to join us with a closing Ave Maria. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.
Take care. God bless. Go Irish. Thanks again, Sarah. Always wonderful to talk to you, Lou. Bye-bye.